Welcome to this month's episode of Short Clip Case Studies, brought to you by Natera Performance Solutions. All right, so this case study is on a vertical jump improvement in a collegiate swimmer. So I can be very long-winded. I'm going to try to keep this um, not too long. Of a, of, I tend to turn things into full-length presentations. So I'm going to keep this short and to the point. Essentially, I had an athlete come in uh, as a freshman uh, back when I worked at UC Berkeley uh, five years ago. And he had, came in with an elite vertical jump already, 36 inches or about 91 centimeters. And over the course of his four years, he gained five and a half inches on his jump or around 14 centimeters. And although I think that's not uncommon for people to make those gains, I mean, it's a stout gain. Uh, it's not uncommon, but I feel like the intervention that we had to do specifically was unique. Uh, whereas in the past, I would have not achieved that intervention and I would have left vertical jump inches on the table with other athletes like this one. What I'm saying is if I wouldn't have done the interventions I did, maybe he would have only gained two or three inches in his time with me. And so, and again, I'm also not going to claim that, I'm not going to claim that I am the sole reason, my program is the sole reason that he was able to achieve what he did. Uh, but I do, we did see some very direct correlations with some of the interventions that we did that were different than the norm. And we saw very quick and subsequent spikes in improved vertical jump ability. Okay. So this, uh, that's the athlete there, by the way, on the right doing a jump. I sadly, I don't have a video. I wish I did. It's really amazing how high this guy could get up off the ground. But uh, just so one thing you'll notice about him, he's, he is loose jointed. You see how much pronation he has at the bottom phase of his jump. He's extremely elastic. Um, really has long limbs, um, very like sinewy, elastic, like kangaroo, uh, kangaroo limbs, really. So he's a guy who, if you were to say uh, it's, you're either a kangaroo or you're a gorilla, if you classified athletes that way, it's a kangaroo. He has long limbs, long tendons, long feet, long curled toes, uh, loose jointed, but I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that. Just know he uh, used a large range of motion in his arms and joints to, to create his movements. Uh, he is a neurotype 1B, but very simply put, he is an athlete who needed to be explosive to be his strongest versus athletes who need to be strong to be explosive. So an elastic athlete needs to be explosive to be his strongest. Not particularly strong. His deep squat may have been around 275, probably a little bit higher. We never maxed it, and we didn't do a deep back squat. We usually did front squat. So as a guy, he might have his front squat max may have been around 250, maybe. Um, back squat, maybe a little over three if we would have max, but not much more than that. Not a super strong guy. He did not respond that well to heavy lifting. Uh, he came in as a freshman jumping 36, put 50 pounds on his squat. I get, we didn't max. That's an estimate, but I would be pretty confident that he did. And with a minimal vertical jump gain, less than an inch, uh, it actually went down in the fall when we were in the midst of our heavier lifting. Uh, and then he was listed, funny enough, as a force need on the just the jump app, but all swimmers are. They're all listed as force need because they jump in zero gravity, so it's just kind of the way they move. He did not uh, do well with the grinds, like heavy grindy lifting, the isometric, isometric phase, the triphasic. Yearly progressions, so started about 36.5, uh, topping out his freshman year, got up to 41.4 by a senior. The biggest progress was his junior and senior year. And I felt like those were the years that we were really hitting on all cylinders on the interventions that we utilized. Um, so as you see with the star, so those were the years that we really were starting to do oscillatory type interventions. Uh, the program was based on triphasic training, but with a modification to the isometric phase. So for those of you not familiar with triphasic, typically it's two weeks of eccentric training and then a deload, two weeks of isometric style training, then a deload, excuse me, two weeks of reactive style training. Eccentric meaning, the old way would be like six seconds down, explode up on the rep. Uh, Cal's updated version is a super maximal, although I personally don't use the super maximal option. Isometric would be holding lifts for four seconds at the bottom, like snap the bar quick down to the bottom of a squat or bench, hold it four seconds and explode up as hard as you can. So reactive is just fast up and down lifting, uh, high speed reactive work. And so of course, if the weight's heavier, that's a little harder to do, but just fast traditional lifting. So one of the big things that we did was we limited grinding work and we replaced a lot of the work with oscillatory reps um, and speed reps, especially in the isometric and reactive periods. And we didn't go too terribly heavy on the eccentric. We definitely didn't do super max. Uh, elastic athletes are not great responders to that. And then in my opinion, 
And then on the, the ISO and reactive weeks, we really cater to his um, elastic nature. In the program, we would do 14-day cycles. So oh, let me just say this. I'll just mention this real quick. Um, the big things that we were changing then is with the isometric phase. We would replace, say, dropping to the bottom of a squat, holding for four seconds, exploding up with dropping to the bottom of a squat with a little lighter weight, uh, bouncing up and down as fast as you can three times over maybe a three inch range of motion, then exploding up. That's one rep. We would do that for two, maybe three reps. And it would, you'd have to drop weight to do that. It, you can't do that. <laughs> you cannot do that with as heavy a weight as a typical ISO uh, four second hold or whatnot. And so for elastic athletes, as was uh, Sheldon Dunlap when he was at UC Davis working with track, a track jumper is an elastic athlete, and he had great results with that population using oscillatory reps. So we found the oscillatory switch to be extremely effective for this athlete. And then the reactive phase, instead of straight up and down lifting, we oftentimes would do speed squats, where instead of, say, you have four reps on a squat, we would say you have five seconds to do this half squat or two-thirds squat as many times as you can. The weight was usually lighter, and so it was just super reactive in nature, and time was a constraint and not a weight to push. And I think manipulating things so it's not just how much weight, how much weight, how much weight is really important, especially for athletes who have a lot of coordination, a lot of elasticity, and that's their engine. And you have to keep their engine their engine. You can't just say, well, if your weight goes your squat and weight goes up this much, X, Y, Z. Although I will say the, the more, I think for like isometric, pure raw overcoming isometrics and maybe, maybe short range like quarter squat type stuff, I think that can be more okay for those, that population. But uh, getting into like very muscle driven, like deep, heavy, deep squats or even heavy half squats sometimes can really be taxing on the way those athletes work and move. So the training program, just to like some samples here, I'm going to give a four week sample. We would work in 14 day cycles where week two is oftentimes different than week one. Uh, I just like that. I feel like at, not for all, uh, but elastic athletes typically do well with that. Just the, shifting around things, some novelties in there in the coordination demand. We ran a five day a week program, kind of modeled off an easy strength or a high frequency model. So we had four days where we were doing some sort of big full body lift and then one recovery day in the middle. So Monday, Thursday were static days, Tuesday, Friday were Olympic days, Wednesday was recovery. They weren't really lifting hard on anything for probably more than 20 minutes for like, um, for lower body, for example. So the static strength day would be one bilateral, one unilateral. That was seemed to yield the best results as far as I'd seen, and that was a more somewhat more recent development for me. As soon as I made that switch and going away from two uh, bilateral days, I noticed outputs were better, uh, just anecdotally speaking. And then two Olympic lift days, uh, variations, I'll get into this, and recovery. So here's what we got. Um, there's a note here, so I will have to explain this a little bit. I, I apologize, I just copied and pasted this, and it's not the whole workout, it's just the lower body and explosive elements. So you'll see the squat days, those are Monday, Thursday. So Monday for squat day, two thirds front squat. So we don't, I don't typically or often go all the way down or full range. I, 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 I bide which time I actually spend doing the full range work. So we had a two thirds of the way down front squat. There's a note and that was like a five second down tempo. So one, two, three, four, five seconds down, quick up. Box jump, superset with a box jump, physio ball jackknife, uh, just as a filler, three rounds of that. And again, this is the work that he was not ultimately responsive to, but this is just an example of a, a weak phase. Uh, the, work, the stuff that he was more responsive to was the Olympic days. So the Olympic day, it's all important for him, though. It's, you know, it's not like one's better than the other. You need it all. So Tuesday was a block, clean, and push jerk. Uh, that would be my like high coordination demand Olympic lift day. I made that switch a couple of years ago as well, where instead of just saying, okay, Monday, Tuesday, Friday, we're going to do cleans. Uh, like just kind of waves or heavier. I really wanted to start to inject coordination demands in there so that it wasn't just the same thing, just with rep manipulations and stuff like that. And the guys seem to like that more. And I, I know there is something to not introducing new coordination at sensitive points and that new coordination demands can be, um, can also cause fatigue, but we also went pretty light on those days. We didn't really go too heavy on them. So that was like a light block clean and push jerk there. Then they would superset that with a long jump to a medicine ball backwards overhead throw. All right, second, uh, second uh, static day would be, be a rear foot elevated split squat, again, with kind of a slower tempo, like five seconds down, quick up. Step up jump, physio ball side to side is filler. 
that last day was uh, I gave them a choice on this day, I believe. I'm like 90% sure. <laughs> I know that's uh, that's really reassuring. But uh, so I what I, I'm almost positive I did was in this day, just back going back and deciphering this was there's a clean from the floor or you could do an overcoming quasi ISO trap bar, which doesn't really fit with the Olympic day quite as much, but it was more of a like a little bit of a posterior chain thing where you would lift a heavy bar mid shin off pins, one inch off pins for three seconds and set it back down. And they would superset either the clean or the overcoming quasi iso trap bar with the medicine ball vertical throw. So just a high rate of force development type day. Uh, and then the med ball vertical throw. Week two, like I said, I do a 14 day cycle. So you'll see instead of a two thirds squat, we got a half squat front squat from pins where they would still, there's no note, but it's three reps. So I, I would make them drop uh, five seconds down to the bottom, explode up again. Now it's just a shorter range of motion. Uh, depth jump, one rep in between, physio ball jackknife. Uh, then on the Olympic day, again, you got block, clean, and split jerk. That's your high coordination day, long jump to medicine ball backwards. Um, this week was a little different one because I believe they had a competition. So you have for the Olympic day is moved to Thursday, the heavier day, and that turned into French contrast. So week one, it was more of a normal Olympic day with one superset in there. Uh, the second was a French contrast Olympic day. So it goes high pull from blocks, med ball vertical throw, snatch, and then med ball rhythm throw. For elastic athletes, this stuff is awesome and they love it. And so I, was, I always try to get this stuff in for elastic athletes. But French contrast, I don't necessarily do it every week because I don't want it to... I don't want to use it up that fast, if that makes sense. If you do French contrast every week for a period of time, eventually you come desensitized to it. So we try to use it every other week or we just, we would be, we would really be uh, mindful of when and how and how much we did specifically of that. Cause that's like the nitrous fuel. Uh, then we just did a light, like kind of a lighter pull up day. And that was likely before a competition on that Friday. All right. So second little two week wave of this, uh, we back to two thirds front squat, box jump, uh, that squat though, this time was a four second hold at the bottom. However, uh, for Pavel, we did, uh, or our athlete in our case study, we did oscillating reps. So we would drop weight a little bit and then we do three quick oscillating reps and then pop back up instead of the hold, the four second hold. So he'd be lighter that day. Olympics would be the same block, clean, push jerk, med ball, rhythm throw. So there we were trying to mix it up a little bit. Uh, squat, we have the roof at elevated split squat with the four second down typically, but for him it was oscillatory reps. Uh, and then so three, so quick three oscillations and pop up, step up, jump, and then Olympic lift. Now we have a wave in there. So it's two, two, one, two, one. So we're just waving up. And I would usually do waves for that stuff. Med ball vertical throw in between. All right, last week I'll show you guys. And then again, we're going off of the two thirds front squat to a half range motion front squat. It says from pins, but they're actually going to be holding the weight. Well, typically they would have held the weight uh, right off the the pin, and and pop the or sorry, the the prescription was actually to hold the bar an inch off the pin isometrically, four seconds explode up. Um, Pavel would have just done quick oscillatory reps in this scenario, or I would have just had him be really explosive with a lighter weight. One of those two options on this type of day. Uh, depth jump, one rep, physio ball, jackknife. Again, block, clean, split jerk, just getting a little bit heavier as we go, as we've introduced that stimuli. Uh, you'll see we're pretty light on the squat and Olympic lift. I think they again had a meet on the Saturday. So we, we still had the, we still had something in there, but it was just a little, it was less. You see, we just have two rounds on the French contrast day, two rounds on that split squat day. So a stimulatory load, not something that's going to overload the system. Uh, so that's just an example of how we kind of took that and we, uh, made it a little bit more elastic in nature, more coordinative, and more fast. Okay, so a quick summary on these concepts. Um, one is that increasing maximal strength, uh, it is good. I mean, you want to have a higher horsepower of the athlete, greater outputs, as we would say. Uh, but how you get to those outputs is important uh, when we're considering actual like dynamic things like jumping, sprinting, and whatnot. And for um, elastic athletes, using heavy grinds to accomplish your mission is not always the best route, especially once the athlete is at a higher level of performance. Uh, you need to learn if your athletes are more muscle uh, or tendon driven, and that will help with the exercise selection. And probably more importantly, a, a better word than that is not even exercise selection, but mode of the exercise. Is the exercise more of a grind or is it more elastic and oscillating? And so uh, elastic athletes will do better 
uh, where they do depart is they need to be more explosive to be their strongest. So their higher proportion of their training must be of the explosive nature. Um, take out some of the isometric holds and pauses that may be in a more muscle-driven athlete's program and replace that with oscill fast oscillating reps and work. Uh, and lastly, uh, as I said, those athletes don't do as well with the longer yielding isometric holds. Um, they'll do better. They will do well with um, a, a amount of ISO push or overcoming holds. Those are fine because that that's it's a short hold. It's not a very long, and it's it's a maximally explosive. So to me, that's fine. It's just more the the slower, longer um, ISO hold phases that you might see in paused reps are are not really great. And what I don't have listed, but those athletes tend to do better with a higher proportion of plyometrics as well as complex training in their program. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, quick summary and presentation. Thank you. <laughs>